Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone and today I am pleased to welcome two people who are responsible for one of the most unique and beautiful books I have ever read. The book, entitled Letters from Hollywood, is a collection of rare correspondence written by some of the most famous and talented Hollywood legends of all time. The editors of this remarkable book are here with us, Rocky Lang and Barbara Hall. Welcome to our show and thank you both for being here. Thanks for having Thanks for us. Having us. Your book is simply marvelous, and any Hollywood film buff must see it to believe it. It contains 137 personal letters from movie stars, directors, screenwriters, producers, agents, everyone from Barrymore to Garbo to Houdini to Bergman to Bogey to both Hepburns. The list just goes on and on. Rocky, I think it was you who came up with the idea to produce this book. Can you tell us how that happened? Yes, it was, it was quite innocently uh, happened out of, I guess, the universe delivered it to me. I was at the AFI many years ago in 1980, and there was a, an assistant librarian there named Howard Prouty, who's now the acquisitions archivist at the Margaret Herrick Library, which is the Academy Library. And one day I got a letter from the, from the library and the, I, the Academy, I didn't know what it was. I opened it up and it said, uh, Dear Rocky, you won't remember me but I was the assistant librarian when you were a fellow, a directing fellow there in 1980, and I found something that might be of interest to you. And behind that was a letter that my father had written in the late 1930s to the famous agent, H.N. Swanson. And my father had just come with 50 bucks in his pocket and wanted a job as an agent. And my dad went on to be a, a super agent representing Bogart and Crawford and then a producer and universal executive and the letter was so touching to me because it showed my father's voice and at such an age he was only 24 when he wrote the letter and it was it was just so emotionally affecting and I had to thank Howard and so in meeting Howard he showed me the archives at the Herrick Library and on the way home I said oh wow there should be a book called Letters from Hollywood and I called my agent and he said great idea and it's like all great ideas then you say holy you know crap how am I going to do this and as a filmmaker my entire life, I'm not a historian and archivist, so I asked Howard to recommend somebody, and he recommended Barbara, and that became, you know, sort of the golden ticket. And uh, Barbara, having, you know, all the years of an archivist and historian, she was my guide to finding the letters, and we formed this partnership, and the book was our production. And there you go. Now, uh, just for people who don't know, Rocky's father was Jennings Lang, a major producer and studio executive at MCA Universal. Very, very highly respected man. Barbara, you are a film historian and archivist. These letters were contained in film libraries, archives, private collections, estates. Clearly, there were thousands of hours of research involved. In your introduction to the book, you described it as an overwhelming process. What was the most challenging part? Well, you know, I had worked in this field for many years, including many, uh, quite a few years at the Academy's Margaret Herrick Library. So I was pretty familiar with their collections already, but approaching it from the sort of the other side of the desk as a researcher, I had never done anything quite like that before. And also it was, we were casting such a wide net. I was, we weren't exactly sure what we were looking for. We just knew that we wanted the letters to be revealing, to reveal something about what it was like to work and live in Hollywood, but we weren't specifically just looking for certain topics. So that meant we had to cast such a wide net that that was part of the challenge of it. it was figuring out how, which collections to go to, how to get into those collections, how to find out what was in certain parts of the collection and uh, going to different libraries and archives to do the research. We did do a lot of the research at the Academy Library, but also wanted to, to go to other institutions as well, where I knew that they had great film-related collections. So the University of Texas and USC and UCLA, the American Film Institute, and all along the way, just worked closely with archivists and librarians who, who helped point us towards some of the most interesting materials that they had in their collections. So it was, it, was really a, it was really a great journey, but it was challenging. We couldn't have done it without the archivists and librarians who work at all these various institutions. And one of the things that was most exciting to me about the book was the opportunity to shine a light on those institutions that collect and, and preserve this material and the people who work there doing that incredible, that incredible work that they do of, of saving all of this amazing material about the early days of Hollywood. 
Now, Rocky, were you the one that was responsible for getting the owners of these letters to consent to them being included in the book? To, to a great extent, Barbara and I try to d divide and conquer this task uh, with Barbara looking for the letters and me tr tracking down the rights. And that in itself was an, an amazing journey because the way that the copyright worked, it's not with the, the receiver of the letter, it's with the letter writer. So if Barbara would find a letter, for instance, from Bogey to Houston, I had to go find the, the rights to the Bogey letter. And in, in many cases, this was rather simple, but in some cases it was really crazy. And, and we had to hire a private investigator to track down certain people in certain estates. And I was in the sort of the bowels of these, these, these government buildings looking through wills and estates to track down, you know, who was an heir to this or that. And it was, uh, it was really, it, in some ways, it was a lot of fun. And, and especially when you hit the pay dirt. And in the case of Julian Rowland, who was the daughter of Gilbert Rowland, who Gilbert wrote this beautiful letter to Clara Bow, I looked for her for a couple of months, and finally it turned out that she lived, you know, about three miles from me, and and she was just under the radar, and uh, that became and that became a friendship, and that was the other thing that was quite amazing is there's this sort of fraternity which I'm I think on the outskirts of of the children and the grandchildren of these icons who live in the shadows of greatness. And as they, some of them came together, some of them were very lonely. They're in their 80s and 90s and, and, and they've been isolated. And, and by doing the book, you know, Barbara and I were able to bring them together. We had dinner one night with David Oselznik's son and Paul Henry's daughter and Bella, you know, Bela Lugosi's son. And, and, you know, this were great. It was great. And they became friends. I know that Monica Henry and uh, Jill Rowland went off to the Noir Festival and in, in Palm Springs together. And, and, so there was this whole sort of great feeling about the book uh, on all levels. And so, yeah, that was, that was the tracking down of, of the letters. We, we not only had that great dinner where, we got, where I got to meet some of the people that Rocky had met along the way, but we also made an effort to invite a lot of these, these people that we had met, these uh, sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters of the uh, people in the book to come to some of the events around the promotion of our book. So we would often have them there reading the letter from, that their parents wrote and then talking about it afterwards. And that was a really special addition to, to the, the, the process of, of getting out there with the book is being able to bring those people along with us. You have no idea how much I wish I had been there. <laughs> you know, when I start my day, I love a great cup of coffee to get me going. And as I'm sure you know, I love the golden age of Hollywood and the legendary stars of that era. Earlier this year, I discovered a terrific new company, Breakfast at Dominique's, that's created a series of coffee blends to honor the legacies of many legendary stars. One of my favorites is the Joan Crawford Grand Hotel blend, rich and bold with hints of nuts, cocoa, and soft spices. And there's a brand new Joan Crawford coffee called the Unchained blend, a hazelnut medium roast. There's the Boris Karloff Master of Horror blend, which is an African dark roast. And the Mary Pickford, the Sweetheart blend, a French vanilla medium roast. The Harold Lloyd, the Boy's Best Friend blend is a Peruvian light roast. The Ava Gardner, the Goddess Blend, is a Sumatra Colombian dark roast. There's the Ella Fitzgerald, the Jazz Club Blend, a candied pecan flavored medium roast. And just making its debut on the roster of these great coffees is the Bozo the Clown, the Big Top Blend, a caramel corn flavored medium roast launched by the wonderful David Arquette. And I'm absolutely thrilled to tell you that very soon, Breakfast at Dominique's will be introducing the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend. It's my very own medium roast coffee, and I know you're just going to love it. Breakfast at Dominique's uses only high-quality, vegan, sugar-free, and gluten-free ground coffee that's organic and follows fair trade practices. And that's important to me. Not only is the coffee delicious, it's beautifully packaged and makes a great gift for friends, especially people like me who are classic movie buffs. If you're looking for a great cup of coffee, give Breakfast at Dominique's a try. You can order any of the coffees named after some of the greatest cinematic legends, and me, at hollywoodblends.com. To tell you the truth, I even feel glamorous when I'm drinking it. Why not have a cup while you're watching our show and add a touch of Hollywood to your day? It's clear that the main objective of the book is to document the history of the Hollywood film industry through letter writing. 
and to give us some insight into how the film industry operated from the 20s to the 70s. How did you go about deciding which letters to include in the book? What criteria did you use? Well, it was it was definitely a challenge. As you mentioned earlier, the, the research process involved looking through hundreds, if not thousands of letters at, in the, at the different institutions we visited, as well as things that were sent to us by private collectors and friends. And then we had a group of, I would say probably about, I don't know, uh, six or 700 letters that we had kind of narrowed it down to. And then from there, we had to get it down to the number that we could put in the book. So it, it was a process of elimination. I mean, Rocky can speak to this too. For me, what was important was that there be some content to the letter that did shed light on something about the Hollywood system or what it was like to work in Hollywood at that time. So we wanted to include famous names that people would would recognize and famous and, and people talking about famous movies and or landmark movies that that um, were important during the years of recovering but we also didn't uh, discount a letter just because it was maybe written by someone who wasn't famous sometimes those letters had the most interesting material in them so we tried to make it a combination of all of those uh, different factors to to bring together something that we thought really represented the hollywood community the only thing I would add to that is, and this was really sort of, again, under Barbara's direction, because I, I tend to think very commercially because I'm a filmmaker, is that it was important to us that it be between filmmaker and filmmaker, actor or actress. And so it didn't really extend out. I mean, Barbara found a, some fun letters that were fan based, but we felt those were better suited for another, another project. And so each letter really talks about the film and it shows the relationship between you know, person to person. Were there some letters that you rejected because they were just too private or indiscreet or embarrassing? I, I don't know that they were embarrassing. I mean, there were a couple letters we found that I, I think were uh, revealing more than embarrassing. There's a peck and ball letter Jerry filled them at the Wild Bunch in the music. Hmm. And it was a really brutal letter that Peck and Todd had written about. He didn't like the score. And as I recall, I think Field and Wind up winning the Oscar for the for, for best score on that movie. And, you know, we, we, had, we had sent it out and it was, you know, brutally rejected. And it, but, but most of the time, Barbara and I were able to assess the value of the letter and whether or not we wanted to go that way because it was never going to be a salacious book. There were other events where in a few occasions where we were where we asked for a letter to be in the book and they were rejected but that only happened in a couple of a couple occasions another factor we took into account is that sort of what you just mentioned a moment ago is about the timeline that we we wanted to find letters that we could put in chronological order which we sort of decided early on would be the the, the way we would structure the book that would kind of take us on a little bit of a journey through film history. I mean, we don't think of it at this book as a as an in-depth history of Hollywood, but it definitely it gives you a an interesting historical timeline. So we were looking for letters that would kind of fit well into that chronology. So that was a lot another thing we're looking for. And then another decision we made along the way, which I think was a good one, was to get as many voices as we could into the book by only including with just a couple of small exceptions one letter per person. So even though that we sometimes would find a treasure trove of letters written by one particular person, we would only choose one of those letters because we wanted to get as many voices into the into the mix as we could, as well as as many crafts and you know as many people from different backgrounds, people in different stages of their careers. So we looked for people we look we have a lot of letters that come from people who are just getting started. And then we have letters like the one that that Rocky mentioned from Gilbert Rowland to Clara Bow that speaks to the end of someone's career. So we really were looking at all of these different factors as we went along. For me, the beauty of the book is that each letter is reproduced as it actually was. These are high resolution scans that show exactly what the letters look like. As you know, there are handwriting experts out there who can analyze a person's handwriting and discern personality traits of the writer. And because you've reproduced the actual letters, we can all become amateur handwriting experts. And I love that. 
Yeah, that was always very important to us. I think Rocky and I were both on the same page about that from the very beginning, that we wanted to find a publisher who would reproduce the letters in their entirety so that the reader could read the entire letter and not to, for it to be excerpts or any or just transcripts of the letters. And so we were really lucky that we landed with Abrams Books because they do such a beautiful job designing books. They were really open to that idea of reproducing every single piece in its entirety as a high-res scan. I should mention that every handwritten letter is accompanied by the typed version, just in case we can't read the handwriting, and I really appreciated that too. Yeah, some of the handwriting is a little tricky to read, and also I've been reading articles in recent years saying that uh, some younger People aren't really familiar with reading cursive handwriting. Since we've gone so much away from writing in cursive nowadays, it might be hard for some people to read it. So that's why we wanted to do that. The other thing about showing a letter from long ago as it actually looks is that it gives you a feel for the era when the letter was actually written, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I was always in the back of my mind. I mean, the content was always the most important part to me, but I was also always keeping an eye out for interesting looking letters and letters, uh, different formats. I mean, as you know, we have a number of telegrams in the book. And that's, of course, a antiquated form of communication that a lot of people aren't familiar with. So I think uh, it was great to reproduce some of those. We have an example of what was known as V-mail from World War II, which was written by the director, Sam Fuller. That was a specific kind of uh, mail that was used by GIs during World War II. So we looked for things like the hotel letterhead. So many people would go and stay in hotels and then write letters to people on using the hotel letterhead. So that was always interesting. We have the Chateau Marmont in there. We have the Garden of Allah hotel, uh, which is long gone, but it was an icon, iconic site here in Hollywood. So we have some things like that. And then we even have some illustrated letters in the book as well that really add a beautiful visual touch to the book, I think. Now, given that these were private letters, not meant for public viewing, what do you think the letter writers would have thought if they'd known that one day their letters would be made public? My feeling is, is that most of these letters were donated to archives and libraries. So at least the receiver of the letter was aware of what he or she was doing and wanting it to be preserved for research. In regard to the letter writer, also many of the letter writers had their own archives. There were in, in some instances, letters that we used in the book that we do not know how the letter writers would have felt by putting their personal letters in, in the book. And in one of the letters that uh, we were rejected for was for that very reason, the, the daughter of the, of, of the letter writer did not want that letter in the book because she viewed that as a personal letter from her father to Joe Mankiewicz. I disagreed with that because both men had given their letters to archives. And so we had a discussion about that. There, there was one letter that Barbara found that was really terrific, and it was written uh, by Joan Fontaine to Hitchcock very early in Joan's career, and I believe it was about suspicion, and, and we, we sent it to her daughter and asked uh, Joan's daughter whether or not we could use it in the book, and, and her daughter uh, said, said no, and I said, well, why? And she says, well, she, she was such an, an ingenue. She was so young. She seemed so innocent. And I said, well, of course she was so innocent. She was, you know, 20, 21 years old. I mean, that's what you would expect. And she's, oh, no, no, no. Her audience sees her as a very sophisticated actress. And I said, yeah, but the letter is so great. And it was, look at her, how her career went. Look at that great relationship that happened with, between Joan and, and Hitch. No, 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 no. I don't, want, I don't want people to see her being so young. And so, of course, you know, we couldn't use the letter. And it was really sad for us because it was a great letter. And, you know, so people reacted differently. Yeah, that is disappointing. Along with each letter, you've written a brief explanation giving the writer's background and the context of the letter. Those pieces are extremely well researched. How did you find out all that background information? A lot of it was just knowledge that I've, uh, you know, that I came across while while researching for the letters and things that I was familiar with. And then I, I used uh, primarily the Margaret Herrick Library to do research on each of the letters. Once we decided which ones we're going to use, went back and did more research on each letter to 
you know, figure out who are these different people who are being mentioned in the letter? How much information do we need to give? We didn't have a lot of room to, to write a really lengthy explanation. So I, I really just tried to focus on what I felt were the most important things that would help a reader understand the letter when they read it for themselves. To me, the most important thing to read in the book is still the, letter, the, are still the letters themselves, but the, the text that goes with it is really just to help illuminate some of the names and issues and ideas that you come across in the in the uh, letter. So I'm happy well, to hear that you that it that that worked. Barbara, you wrote that these letters spanning 50 years make you realize how much and how little the world has changed. What did you mean by that? I guess I meant that you know, so many of the same issues that we're dealing with in the 21st century with entertainment were still issues were issues that were people were dealing with, you know, 50 years ago. And and not only just issues with the entertainment industry, but also just in terms of societal issues, cultural issues. Um, a lot of things have evolved, but a lot of things have, uh, have stayed the same as well. For instance, uh, censorship is still an issue that people deal with in the industry, and it's been an issue for 100 years since movies started. Many of the letters had me wanting to see the recipient's response to the letter. You did publish Catherine Hepburn's reply to Hedda Hopper's letter and George Roy Hill's reply to Tom Hanks. Did you get to see any of the other responses? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times the response would be there as well. We just weren't able to include the both sides of, of, the, of the correspondence just for space reasons, but there would have been a lot of other examples. There's another good one with, that has both the original and the response, which is the telegram about Jane Fonda's birth uh, between William Wyler and Henry Fonda. It was, it was great to include both sides of that correspondence as well. Some of my favorite letters were the fan letters that some stars wrote to other stars. I really love the letter from Fred Astaire congratulating David O. Selznick on his movie Rebecca. Yeah, that was great. You know, I'm a big fan of, of Fred Astaire and I, he was known as one of the nicest people in Hollywood and I think that really comes across in his letter. I have an idea for your next book. How about a collection of fan mail that the big stars have kept over the years from their favorite fans? I definitely, as Rocky said, you know, I came across some great fan letters in my research. And also I've, I've seen many examples of fan letters over the course of my, my years working in archives. And I think that would be a great idea. There's a wonderful letter we have in our book that's uh, from Preston Sturgis, which I found over at UCLA. And it's a letter that, you know, where he talks about a number of his films. And I'm a huge admirer of his. So it was really exciting for, for me that we were able to include Preston Sturgis in the book. But in the course of looking for that piece, I went through many, many folders and found just incredible fan mail in that collection that had been sent to Sturgis that he had kept. And he would reply with pretty long letters back to most of the fans who would write to him, even if someone wrote in not liking one of his movies. So at that time, I thought that would be a great idea for a book. So maybe someday. <laughs> Yeah, Rocky, I think you need to keep all the fan mail you get on all of your films. Keep the best letters because they might go in the next book. <laughs> uh, yes, okay. I keep those, the, the, the tens of letters that I've gotten is, a, is for fan mail. It's been be great. No, it, it, it was terrific. This was, a, a you know, a, just a great experience uh, overall. I mean, I think you've gotten it from me. The, the, the emotional journey for me was transformational. I, I never expected to have this experience when I when I started this with Barbara, you know, four years ago. It was quite quite amazing. So just to give our audience a sense of the wide variety of letters in the book, I thought it might be fun to mention a few of my favorites and get your comments. I love the letter from Betty Davis to Jack Warner complaining about her working conditions. Yes, that was that was from the uh, Warner Brothers archives at USC. Uh, that's the repository for all of the material. It's a huge collection, studio collection, all the material from Warner Brothers up until 1967, including legal files. And I believe that it was in Betty Davis's legal file that I came across that and a number of other letters where she was battling with them over her contract. I just really thought it it really represented who she who she was. She was fearless as an actress, but she was also fearless when it came to standing up for her rights. And she, as I mentioned in what I wrote 
to, to accompany the letter, she kind of paved the way for other actors who who went on to stand up for their rights, like Olivia de Havilland, who very famously actually sued over her contract and won. And she kind of broke the broke the system in a way for the seven-year contract or a lot of the most unfair aspects of the seven-year contract system. But she wouldn't have been able to do that if other actors like Davis, and there were others too, James Cagney and a lot of other actors who were pushing back against the studios and their sort of exploitation of, of actors, even their biggest stars. I love the letter from Joan Crawford describing when she, Marilyn Monroe, and Anita Ekberg were presented to the Queen and being embarrassed by the tight dresses that Marilyn and Anita were wearing. Yes, that was, I, I liked that letter a lot. By all accounts, it seems like uh, Joan Crawford wrote thousands of letters over the course of her career. So uh, trying to find one to narrow that down to one was pretty difficult. Uh, she wrote a lot of thank you notes and she she wrote she wrote a lot to her fans as well. I think there could be a whole book of just fan letters to Joan Crawford and her replies. But I thought this one was interesting. Jane Ardmore was a was a good friend of hers. She was a Hollywood journalist. And I just liked the personal note in the letter and uh, and then I love the slightly snarky little thing about Marilyn and Anita Ekberg. You can definitely tell Joan is not too, uh, not too impressed with the new generation of movie stars. Yes, exactly. There's a wonderful letter from Ronald Coleman in 1928 saying that sound pictures were a retrogressive and temporary digression, nothing more than a fad, and that silent pictures would prevail. How short-sighted was he? Uh, it's, it's so ironic because he became known. He wasn't one of these actors who whose career faltered because he couldn't really make the transition to talking pictures. I mean, he became famous for having one of the most, you know, remarkable voices and, and being, you know, this amazing stage actor who easily transitioned over to, to movies. So it, yeah, it was a little strange, but I think it was, it's, I, I love that letter because it was, it was representative of how a lot of people did feel at the time. You know, silent films had, had reached a, a level of artistry that was, was pretty phenomenal at that point. And now we look back and think, of course, you know, sound was only going to make them better. But some people felt that it was going to compromise the art form. There's a great letter from Marlena Dietrich to Ernest Hemingway written in 1955 in which Miss Dietrich writes, I am lonely. It's a good profession, this, but a lonely one. You are all on your own in every way. That's quite a powerful statement about what it's like to be a star. Well, that, that letter was found actually at the JFK Library in Boston, which is uh, in, in that collection, which is almost entirely of the JFK, RFK, and Teddy Kennedy papers. Hemingway's estate uh, was so impressed with, with Jackie Kennedy that they gave the Hemingway papers there. And within that collection are a de a de at least a decade of these letters between Dietrich and Hemingway, many of them raw love letters. They, were, they had this love affair that as far as I know was not consummated, but it travels her career. And the letter that you're referring to is when Dietrich was really sort of at, at the end of, end of her career and she was in, in cabarets and she had started in cabarets and now she was back in cabarets. And it's a very revealing letter of, uh, of, of sort of a, what a fading star. And she was certainly a star. And uh, it was a, it's, it's a really emotional letter. And in fact, many of the letters within that collection are, are, are devastatingly honest. Well, get, talking about emotional letters, one of the most poignant letters that actually has stayed with me is by Carl Lemel head of Universal Pictures to director William Wyler in 1938, begging him to help rescue German Jews out of Nazi Germany and into America. That letter really moved me. And frankly, it was worth a hundred times the price of the book. I'm glad that it had that effect because, you know, I really feel like Carl Emley and the other, a lot of other Hollywood figures deserve a lot of credit for everything they tried to do in the 1930s to call attention to what was going on in Nazi Germany and and then actually you know taking action to get refugees out of out of Europe and over to America and you know I, I felt it was really important to include that letter not only because it's so emotional and I agree and it just shows 
what a good heart he had and how committed he was to the cause. But also because in the last few years, there have been some books that have accused Hollywood of turning turning away from the issue or not wanting to address it or ignoring the issue. And that was the case. It did take them a while to start making movies about it. It's true for various reasons, but individuals in Hollywood were trying to make a difference. And Carl Lemley really led the way and he inspired so many other people in Hollywood to, to follow his lead and sponsor um, a lot of refugees to come to Hollywood and to come to America, some to come to Hollywood to work and others just to live here and get away from what was going on in Europe. I was really impressed by Ginger Rogers' letter about the lack of opportunities for women producers in Hollywood. She wrote that in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really liked that letter too. I mean, that was one of several letters we had in the book that were written to Hedda Hopper, who, as you, I'm sure you know, was a very powerful gossip columnist in Hollywood from the late 1930s up into the 1960s and very influential. And it, there were so many amazing letters in her collection. It was hard to, to, you could, that's another book you could do. It's just nothing but letters that were written to Hedda Hopper. But I thought that one was really good too. And I think it's particularly interesting right now because just this past year, there was a terrific book written about the producer, Joan Harrison, who was also very active in the forties and uh, went on to be the main producer of the Alfred Hitchcock television show. So I, I like the idea of calling attention to the fact that there were pioneering women producers working in the film industry in the 1940s. There's a great letter from Hattie McDaniel to gossip columnist Hedda Hopper in 1947 about the issue of black actors and actresses who played servants in movies being stereotyped and whether they fit the definition of an Uncle Tom. Yeah, I thought that was a very interesting letter too, you know, because it just shows that there was, there was already a, a major discussion about representation going on in Hollywood, even as far back as the, as the 1940s. And of course it goes all the way back to the 1930s as well. I could go on and on about these letters, but I think I've given our audience a small sample of the many gems that this book contains. Rocky, I wanna ask you, do you have a favorite letter? Outside of the letter from my father, I would say that one of my favorite letters or two favorite letters would be the, the, the telegram from David O. Selznick to Hal Wallace about Casablanca, because it's just a great letter of uh, Ingrid Bergman's emergence as a star. And I have a very soft spot for the letter we spoke about earlier from uh, Gilbert Rowland to Clara Bow, because it's so honest, it's so sentimental, and it's, it's reflective of a, of a lost love and a lost time because the, the letter sort of refers to their love affair and the movies they, they'd made the silent era. And at this point, when the letter written, it was written, Clara was in a, in a sanitarium uh, recovering and, and, and Gilbert Rowland was you know, not where he was at, the time, at that time. And so it, you know, as someone who is in the 60s like me, and you think about the lost loves and you think about the lost times of your life, it, you know, it has a resonance to a lot of people in a very subtle way. And I think that those two, you know, are, speak out, although the Hanks letter is hilarious and, you know, the Bogart letter is great. And, you know, there's, there's so many letters in it, but I would say that those two uh, sort of stick out for me. What about you, Barbara? Do you have a favorite? Well, it's, it's, I think it's a little bit like trying to pick your favorite child, you know, I mean, the, there's something that I, you know, there's something that I love about each of the letters. That's why we chose them to include them in the book. But, but there are quite a few that I really, that I really like. I actually really like the letter from Alfred Hitchcock. And the, the reason I was very excited to find that letter is because I worked with the Alfred Hitchcock collection at the Academy Library. Actually, I was one of the very first people to work with that collection back in the 1980s when it first arrived. And there really weren't a lot of letters from Hitchcock included in, in the collection. I think maybe if there are a lot of them in existence, maybe the family has held on to them. But I came across this letter from him when he was getting ready to move to America to work on Rebecca. And I found it at the University of Texas in their David Selznick, uh, actually Myron Selznick collection. Myron Selznick was his agent. And I just really thought it was great because it really captured his sense of humor. He, this very wry sense of humor that he had. And, and I was just excited about it because I hadn't seen very many letters written by him 
uh, that were really in his voice. So I was excited by that. I also really love some of the letters that are more personal, like the letter between James Wong Howe and his wife, Sonora Babb. I really love that letter because they had a lifelong romance and were so close. And it sort of showed how difficult it was for married couples when one person had to go away on location the way James Wong Howe had to for that, to, to go make HUD, one of his great films. And uh, also he says he has to go buy boots because of the snakes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another thing that, uh, you know, you don't think about with all the challenges that people face when they're working on location. So that's a favorite. And I also really love the letter about the best years of our lives from Robert Sherwood. He is, the, of course, the screenwriter on the best years of our lives, which I think is probably one of the most moving and important American films, you know, of, of, the, of the 20th century. And definitely one of my favorite films. And, you know, I love the letter that he wrote just after the war saying, if we make this movie, is it still going to be relevant in, in a year? I, isn't everybody just going to be back to normal? And of course, Weiler and Goldwyn and everyone else who worked on the film, they knew that wasn't going to be the case, that it was going to take a long time for people to recover from the war. And actually, the movie just really tapped into that into all that emotion. But I thought it was interesting to have a letter where someone was expressing doubts about something that he was working on that turned out to be a masterpiece. You know, the art of letter writing is pretty much gone now that we have emails and text messages and social media. Does that sadden you? For me, you know, there's, there's a sadness uh, of losing the art of letter writing because if you think about it, you have to sit down, form your thoughts and write something and mail it. And then it takes some time to get to them. So it's not a quick, like, oh my gosh, I got a feeling and you throw it off. And how many times have you written an email or a text and go, gee, I wish I could have that pitch back. I, <laughs> I just threw, threw, a, threw a sitting curveball. It's went over the fence, you know, please come back. So you have this opportunity to really be thoughtful in, in what, you're, what you're writing. And it, and, it, and it sort of was a world of slow in a certain way. Whereas now everything is so immediate. And I think that, uh, you know, I think, you know, we evolve as a culture and we, we evolve and things change. You have to embrace that. It's been something that's gone on generation to generation, but at the, the, the same time you lose something. So with every, every sort of step of progress technologically, you know, you lose some of the intimacy of the past. Not only are letters on paper, you know, so much more interesting to read and they, they did, do give you so many clues about a certain time and place when a letter was written. It's not just the content, but as you mentioned earlier, Harvey, the, you know, the, what the letter looks like, the, whether it's handwritten or typed, the letterhead, you know, the postmark, the stamp, you know, all of that kind of material is great for a historian because it gives you more context on the letter. And you just don't get that kind of context when you're looking just at digital, digitally, you know, produced things like emails. Barbara, do you think that the book has possibly encouraged readers to actually visit archives and libraries in their communities, look at historic correspondence, and maybe even be inspired to consider a career as an archivist? Oh, well, I don't know if it's had that effect, but but that would be uh, that would make me very, very happy if that were the case, because I I really feel like it's just so rewarding to go into an archive and look back at, use that as a way to look back at history. So if it inspired people to do that, I, I would be thrilled. And also, of course, would be thrilled if it inspired anybody to go into the archives profession. But yeah, the most, the most exciting thing for me about the book was the opportunity to shine a light on, on all the hard work that's done by all the people who work in all the archives and libraries that, that collect this material. Well, Rocky and Barbara, I have really enjoyed talking with you about your wonderful book, Letters from Hollywood. Thank you for all the hard work you went through to produce it. I know I'm always going to cherish it. And thank you both so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Oh, thank you for having us. It was a lot of fun. And this was great. Thank you for thinking of us and our being a supporter of our work. Our guests have been Rocky Lang and Barbara Hall editors of Letters from Hollywood. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time.
Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.